Imagine, just for a moment, your greatest insult. The moment where someone took your wound, already pouring red, and rubbed salt deep beneath the broken skin. Maybe it's a betrayal by a friend, terrorization by family, maybe it was even a stranger. Their goal was to hurt you, and they succeeded. What now? If you're moral and pure, maybe you turn away at the thought of provoking them further. Maybe you learn to grow and heal and surround yourself with worthy companions. But maybe you're tired of that. Maybe your lack of power becomes so stifling that you now demand its attention. You take all of that blood and all of that salt and you transform it into gory justice. Don't worry. It's a temptation frequently succumbed to. It's almost like a defensive measure. When the Black Widow gets cornered, pinched, or threatened, it bites its way out. Likewise, if we're unable to get justice through legal systems, if the very health of our community is threatened by those who skirt along the edges of accountability, we will achieve their downfall through personal, oftentimes excessive means. Revenge is self-survival. When I was 14, I was going through something monumental. It was an event that could easily be viewed as a catastrophe in the undeveloped mind of a minor. Not only was I losing a parent figure at the time to the mesmerizing void of deadbeat fatherhood, I was also losing my place in this world. With but little preamble, I was plucked out of the one place I ever knew and was dropped like a baby on its head into the cold, hard environment of Dixieland. Yeehaw, brother. <laughs> okay, I'm being a little bit dramatic. I moved out of the city I grew up in into a small town that no one has probably ever heard of before in their lives. It was a fate worse than death. At least I thought so at the time. My first day of school in this new town was met with fear on my part and confusion on the part of everyone I tried desperately to befriend. And I do mean Desperately. <laughs> Ever since I was little, I was afraid of being lonely. It felt like an indication that something was wrong with me if I didn't have friends. But at this new school, not only was I an outsider, I was a pariah in a town where everyone knew each other. And I listened to rock music, so I thought I was quirky and misunderstood. <laughs> what the hell? Oh my God, no. <laughs> Within the first three days of that new school year, I managed to find a group of girls that seemed welcoming to me. They told me to sit with them at lunch and I readily obliged. They even let me tag along whenever they walked around campus. And I felt lucky at the time because it seemed like all of the fears of starting over in a new place turned out to be silly doomsday prep. There was no grand scheme to harm me. There was no convoluted plot to send me back to the city. I found my place, and while it was different from where I expected it to be, I found it nonetheless. I was safe. I was accepted. I was in the beginning stages of bullying that, at one point, was so intense that I thought often about taking my own life. Revenge rarely crossed my mind during those four years. At least not outward revenge. Maybe it was because it occurred before the omnipresence of social media. Maybe I just wanted it to stop. It's not something I really thought about until I started drafting this video. And I think when you're going through something so traumatic, your one wish is to make it out on the other side alive. And I did that. Asking for anything else at that point felt like too much. Now, given the subject matter, I wonder if my revenge would have been virtuous if I had decided upon it when I was younger, if I tripped them in the hallway or turned their friends against them. I wonder if there's such thing as justified vengeance. The opposite is already well-documented. That is, the fall of virtue from vengeance. When that distinctly human characteristic turns man into demon and supposed enemy into martyred victim, we finally see the limits of our wrath. As Emily Bronte wrote in 1847, Treachery and violence are spears pointed at both ends. They wound those who resort to them worse than their enemies. Ugh, I need a good wounding. That sounds 
really, really. Wuthering Heights is an 1847 novel and only novel written by Emily Bronte, one third of the Bronte sisters. And I know what you're thinking. Girl, shut up with all the English literature references. It's boring. It's inaccessible. One sentence lasts 42 pages and by the end of it, you need a cigarette. And to that I say, I am thousands of dollars in student loan debt, girl. I need to use this pointless degree for something. But also, Wuthering Heights is not as bland as you would expect. This novel is like if your juiciest, most controversial K-drama, telenovela, and Tyler Perry film had a one night stand together, followed shortly by a baby out of wedlock who then grows up snorting every exhilarating powder known to mankind. <laughs> Tight, 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 yeah! It's just that good. There's pining, there's toxicity, there's fights. And I'm not talking about those boring duels that you find in every other literature. I'm talking downtown Atlanta. You're in the trenches. You are fighting for your fucking life. There's a scene where a husband confronts his wife for bringing her side piece to their home. And the side piece and the wife tag team jump this man with no remorse. Catherine calls Edgar her husband a weak little bitch and that may not be like a direct quote but it's certainly the gist fair means she said in answer to her husband's look of angry surprise if you have not the courage to attack him make an apology or allow yourself to be beaten it will correct you of feigning more valor than you possess Heathcliff jumps in with the elbow and threatens to beat the brakes off Edgar so badly that he'll have to divorce Catherine, give up his sister for marriage, and fall off the face of the planet Earth just to escape embarrassment. And then, and then, Heathcliff actually beats the eyelashes off of Catherine's brother so badly that it nearly kills him. Who trained this man? Jaden Smith? They're beating the braids off that baby, someone help. He doesn't need to be in a gothic romance novel, he needs to be in the ring. Somehow nestled even within all of this chaos is something still more human. Bloody, sweet, murderous revenge. Heathcliff is far removed from being your typical underdog, and he tells you this directly. We should not be rooting for this man. His introduction into the Earnshaw family starts off sympathetically. He has no parents, no family, no money, no bitches, and is essentially plucked off the streets by some random man who had just walked like 60 miles just to go to the store. Talk about unwalkable cities. But Heathcliff's transition from child to adult isn't as sympathetic. He's abusive and conniving and entirely self-absorbed. Even when he thinks his actions are in the right place, even when he thinks that he's avenging his lost love, Catherine, he's really just trying to stroke his own ego. Wuthering Heights isn't the only violent specter haunting our media. From the Bible to ancient societies to 2000s rom-coms, revenge is ubiquitous. It's as evergreen as the mistreatment that breeds it. But our current era is where this thirst changes pace. With the introduction and slightly suffocating presence of technology, the rise of online harassment, and the incessant buzz of the internet, revenge plays out in much faster, more absolute terms for like a week. <laughs> and then everyone kind of just picks another target. Gone are the days where the aggrieved and the ostracized concoct Labrithian plans to steal wife, child, and property from underneath their enemies. Gone are the days where 24-year-old teenagers conduct faith-shattering schemes to avenge being cheated on. Gone are the days before TikTok. Over the past five months, TikTok has been undertaken by a phenomenon one internet user dubs the Selena Gomez effect, aka the swift and humbling experience afforded to those who are dedicated to the greatest sin of all time, being mean. Now let me give you the rundown on the details. Within these revenge campaigns, there is always a mean girl and a bully victim. Why is it so gendered? I... Uh, 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 Leave me alone! Ah! Ah! 
When TikTok first gets whiff of the mean girl to target, the campaign against her starts a little tame. You have your obligatory hate comments, degrading TikTok trends, and even quirky little tip contests between the mean girl and the bully victim. However, once these campaigns find footing in the tornado of social media, it's not unlikely for the target to have their name and addresses doxxed, businesses shut down, and inboxes flooded with death threats. So it's basically cancel culture when it's co-opted and distorted by people who actually don't know what cancel culture is about. The Selena Gomez effect stems precisely from its namesake, Selena Gomez, or more truthfully, from what the internet did in guise of her name. In February of 2023, TikTok exploded with accusations of bullying aimed at none other than Haley Baldwin Bieber, the nepotism baby to end all nepotism babies. She posted this TikTok where she's surrounded by her other famous friends and they're lip syncing to an audio that goes, I'm not saying she deserved it, but I'm saying God's timing is always right. Mind you, this TikTok came at a very contentious time on the internet because Selena Gomez was simultaneously being dragged and bullied by other people for her appearance. By posting this TikTok, people felt like Hailey Bieber was mocking Selena's public shaming. But wait a minute, what in the 2012 Disney Channel villain is going on here? None of this will make sense to you if you weren't conscious enough to operate a computer 12 years ago. Or I guess if you're a millennial with a real job and real kids and a real family so you don't have time to keep up, or if you're just normal. <laughs> Either way, I have to take you back all the way to 2011, the year when Selena Gomez and Justin Bieber made tween couple history at the Vanity Fair Oscars party. I wasn't very conscious of these two at the time. I was too busy being consumed by the parasite that was One Direction Fever. But everyone was obsessed with Jelena. From cute candids to the intense breakup rumors to the all out brawl between them. And I made him cry. <laughs> well, then that makes two of us. This couple reigned supreme in fandom shipping wars. There were constant rumors of marriage, leaked videos of arguments and serenades, and girl, you really just had to be there. Even Drake was in his feelings about this couple. Amongst all of this chaos, Haley Baldwin of the Baldwins, might I say, was showing nonstop support of Justin and Selena. And just from my basic understanding of the situation, she seemed to be a really big fan of Justin at the time, allegedly, supposedly. She would tweet about how dreamy Jelena's relationship was. She would pose for pictures with Jelena magazine covers. She would even casually meet Justin during performances or red carpet interviews. Not only was she living the dream life of most stands at the time, she also seemed to dedicate her life to being 100% Team Jelena, allegedly. <laughs> I am way too old to be doing this. Long story short, Selena Gomez and Justin Bieber have a very long, drawn out, dramatic, and messy relationship that ends numerous times between 2012 and 2018. During these brief endings, Hailey Bieber and Justin Bieber sparked frequent dating rumors. It's even alleged and has since been disputed by Hailey on a podcast called Call Her Daddy that Justin and Hailey were together while he was also still seeing Selena Gomez. Allegedly and disputed, again, might I add. Mere months after Selena and Justin are rumored to have split for the final time, Justin gets engaged and eventually married to Haley Baldwin Bieber. Rumors insinuate that the time between this relationship with Selena and his engagement to Haley was only two months. We think it is worse the two months lyric that you have in there. Mm -hmm. That part of it for us would be worse than going through a breakup. Yeah. Is having to see someone with someone else so fast. Yeah. You know, I'm really grateful too because I've actually experienced that a million times before. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's the unfortunate part about what I do. It's all very real to me and I'm sure it's just entertainment for other people, but I, I just... I think I had become numb to it. The complicated nature of Jelena's past has created a very toxic environment in the media, which constantly seeks to connect every instance of existence between all three parties to each other. In 2015 and 2016 respectively, Selena stated, of course I got my heart broken. Of course I was pissed about it. There, everyone has it. 
I was so disappointed because I never wanted my career to be a tabloid story. Honestly, what I would love to be printed is that I am so beyond done with talking about that and him. And so we return to February of 2023, that dreaded month of revenge, as Hailey Bieber prepares to endure months of internet lashings. Though quickly deleted after its original posting in January, Hailey's TikTok began making ground on the platform once again. The chatter became so intense so quickly that both Selena and Hailey see it, with Selena commenting, it's okay, I don't let these things get me down. Be nice to everyone. And Haley commenting, we were just having a girls night and did a random TikTok sound for fun. It's not directed at anyone. Amidst all of this, Haley Bieber and Kylie Jenner's eyebrows joined the fray. Oh, brother. White people drama, I swear. <laughs> Selena Gomez posted a TikTok where she says that she accidentally over laminated her eyebrows. A few hours later, Kylie Jenner posted an image of herself on her Instagram stories with the text, this was an accident over her eyebrows. Immediately following this, she posted an image of her and Hailey Bieber on FaceTime together with the camera zoomed in on their eyebrows. Thus, Eyebrowgate was born. Think pieces and conspiracy theories about Hailey Bieber's obsession with Selena Gomez began immediately blowing up on TikTok. People accused her and the Jenner sisters of being mean girls. People accused Hailey of copying Selena down to tattoo placements and content ideas. There are even numerous videos accusing Hailey of being a stalker with such comments as these. This is actually really scary. I'm thinking there's something really wrong with Hailey. Ugh, legit. If she goes Yolanda and murders Selena, we all know what went down. For context on those last comments, Yolanda Saldivar was convicted of killing the singer Selena in 1995 over alleged money disputes and an alleged obsession with Selena. And I just want to say, legally and morally, that none of the accusations against Hailey Bieber are proven to be true. It's mainly just internet gossip at this point. And unless we are shown the need to think otherwise, these should not be taken faithfully. I think comparing her to a convicted murderer is a little much considering how much of the evidence against her is just internet gossip at this point that's coming from T channels who want views. And don't get me wrong, <laughs> this shit is interesting at times. And I think at one point I watched an entire 10 minute TikTok about the situation and I was gagged. Gagged. It tickled that part of my brain that kind of forgets that these are all real people with real feelings and real lives and not just characters in my phone. I think it's very natural or at least natural on our current internet culture to give into that section of your brain a little bit more than you would otherwise. But it's just as important to learn how and when to reel it in for the sake of others. I want to make it very clear that everything I say henceforth is not coming from a place of judgment on the part of TikTok users or even full-fledged defense of the mean girls. I think it's a lot more complex than that because humans are a lot more complex than that. And I want to approach it with humility, curiosity, and introspection. I wear the Scarlet Letter 2, and I am just as much on trial right now as you are. So, Haley has been getting filleted since February. And really, pop culture has been rotating her on and off the grill since her relationship with Justin Bieber began. The reasoning, besides the accusations of alleged stalking, is the fact that Hailey Bieber and her friends, Kylie and Kendall Jenner, give off mean girl energy, according to some internet users. This is becoming a very popular buzzword on TikTok where people gather in comment sections desiring to see mean girls finally get their comeuppance. And I believe that Hailey and her friends are just the beginning. They remind a lot of people of the bullies they had in their youth. And I think netizens are Determined not to let it slide this time. But, but I'm, I'm a fuck no, I'm not gonna let it slide. Even though our methods of revenge have altered in the age of technology, one thing holds past and present together seamlessly. 
the concept of an eye for an eye. In Wuthering Heights, Isabella explains one condition in which she'll forgive her abusive husband, Heathcliff. She states, what misery laid on Heathcliff can content me unless I have a hand in it. It is, if I may take an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, for every wrench of agony, a return of wrench, reduce him to my level. Therefore, revenge is sustained by the equality of suffering. But not only that, revenge is one of the most personal equalizers on planet Earth. It can't be done by someone who is related to the person harmed. The final blow has to be dealt by the victim themselves. And this is true of revenge in every medium, in every era of humanity. When someone does something wrong, the only way justice is felt is if that wrongdoing is returned to them tenfold. Instead of it being on the behalf of the person wronged, medicines tend to act on their own accord. And we'll get into why I think that is, but anti-bully campaigns become less about the original victim and more about the people carrying out a death sentence against their target. People are determined to treat Hailey Bieber and other perceived mean girls exactly how they are accused of treating others. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a TikTok for a TikTok times a million. Anne Hathaway was recently introduced back into the fray of public shaming. You know, years and years after we finally realized we mistreated her and just about every other highly visible woman in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, people have dubbed her a mean girl needing to take accountability after a clip of her refusing to answer a, in my opinion, intrusive interview question surfaced online. And what has she shared? Why would I tell you? Because <laughs> I'm a fan and I need to know. <laughs> One user commented, I would cry if she laughed in my face like that. Poor girl. Someone else stated, this kind of gives mean girl vibes. Another user stated, this clip low-key changed my perception of her. I always thought she was very sweet and kind, but she's giving like mean vibes, to be honest. Now, Anne's current lashing on TikTok is both interesting and funny to me. Funny because I don't particularly find this mean, and interesting because the internet seems to have amnesia when it comes to nice girls. Y'all don't like them either. <laughs> I've seen countless TikToks about Selena Gomez being too nice in the wake of Hailey Bieber's alleged bullying. And even Anne Hathaway has been criticized in the past for being so nice it came off as annoying. It really feels like a game of damned if you do, damned if you don't, misogyny edition and I am quite frankly very tired of playing. Surprisingly, Anne's backlash this time around wasn't as violent as others have been, and I say surprisingly because I know what TikTok is capable of once they set you in their sights. Another viral moment of mean girls getting their comeuppance occurred in April, when a TikTok user by the name of Jackie La Bonita posted a video of herself at an Astros game. The clip features Jackie close to the frame as she's attempting to take photos of herself. Of course, since she's sitting amongst the crowd and she's taking pictures, the people behind her are also in view of the frame. And you can see that throughout the duration of the video, they are heckling and making fun of her. At one point, they record her back, screaming about how lame she is, assumingly for taking pictures, though they deny that later. At another point, one of them even puts up the middle finger to the camera. Girl, believe you me, I was shocked when I found out these girls weren't sophomores in high school because the internet did as the internet does and promptly identified both of the girls behind Jackie. It started off as your typical insult-based public shaming where both girls were reprimanded for their behavior as well as their looks. After that, when the algorithm got too strong and the crowd got too bloodthirsty, the situation escalated. It's reported that the girls' addresses were leaked on the internet and a business that was alleged to have some sort of link to them permanently closed their Google page after receiving an influx of hateful reviews. It's not confirmed exactly who the businesses belong to or if they're even related to the girls, but most people speculate that it was a family business of one of the girls or at least they worked there. Like most of the stories we're covering today, this information is entirely alleged and we have no concrete evidence. Legally, allegedly, please don't sue me. The two girls eventually came online to defend themselves and gave a very tepid apology. 
it it was kind of bad <laughs> because keep in mind if she was sitting in front of us we're not able to see your face we were very uncomfortable at your husband whoever he was that was recording us for an extensive amount of time, knowing that we had just came back from the big screen where we were motivating the winner, which was another woman, you know, like we empower a woman and we would hate for anyone else to go through what we're going through because it was a photobomb moment. Anyone has it. It been the news, the media has it. And if you took it some type of personal way, like... They stated that their behavior in the back of Jackie's video stemmed from this sort of discomfort with being recorded, which I find the latter half of that statement very possible, very valid. I hate the idea of recording people without their consent, especially in public. And while I do understand that it can be tricky to avoid when you're taking pictures or videos out in the wild of the world, it still has the potential to make someone uncomfortable. Even so, I don't think this explanation excuses the immaturity those girls showed that day. There are a lot of ways to approach situations like this, communication being the best of them all, and I think doing what they did was just not cool. Because these girls were exhibiting what the internet is now dubbing mean girl energy, a lot of people didn't have sympathy for their doxing or potential career derailments. I remember when everything was first blowing up and their addresses got leaked, someone commented that the internet was taking it too far, which I do agree with. You know, these are two women who live in a world where it is very dangerous for their places of residence and even their work and other personal information to be made so widely known. This precise reason is why people advocate against home tours or showing the view outside of your windows online or even showing pictures of your house keys because there are very scary people out there who may make use of that information. I remember scrolling in that thread of someone saying that it's unsafe to dox these two women and someone else replied, I don't care what happens to them. They shouldn't have been mean. Some netizens called the downfall of these girls satisfying, while others congratulated the internet for how it handled the situation. Overall, people took this dragging as a sign that bullying will be reduced because bullies will be afraid of potential backlash. One user stated, as a mother of two school-aged girls, I'm glad mean girls are being forced to take accountability. It's an example for the next mean girl out there. Maybe they will think twice if it means their livelihood. I think some of the points presented in this situation are very reasonable. Bullying is a dangerous action that can both psychologically and physically harm the victim. Taking it lightly is simply not an option, especially when prolonged exposure to it can end with physical assault or even death. It's always important to speak up when you see something wrong and support people who may be going through this because I can assure you they really need it. But I also think that there are some instances in this conversation that aren't as precise, if only because the internet is not a precise place. You remember how I mentioned how in Wuthering Heights, Heathcliff approaches his vengeance with an air of justification even though his actions and behavior are damaging to other people, even innocent people, and are entirely egotistical. Yeah, well, RIP to the big homie because everyone found him absolutely insufferable and he died miserable. But I can do you one better than that question. Maybe even three. Question one, does shame and public punishment produce authentic accountability? Question two, does our online treatment of people who commit non-bigoted, non-violent social transgressions reflect the internet's fetish for violent punishment? And question three, does our thirst for punishment outweigh our capacity for support? Oh, the girlies are not gonna wanna hear this one. Back in yay old forever ago, specifically in colonial America, public shaming was quite popular. If you stole a loaf of bread and some dirt, because that's all that existed back then, there was a high chance that you'd be forced to publicly confess to your crime, either verbally or situationally. Some individuals were even made to stand out in busy streets with signs that stated their crime 
or they were brandished with a hot iron on a visible part of their body to sort of reflect their transgression. It's just me or is that <laughs> kinda? Such public humiliation and bodily harm was popular because it reinforced social hierarchies. Reputation was and still is a valuable social currency. We conform to both legal and citizen-made boundaries in order to maintain our positions in society. When we transgress and are found out in our transgression, well, first we go to jail if it's illegal. Some of us do at least. But if it's more of a social taboo formulated by the public and not a law, we'd be sooner dead if everyone found out. Humans are social community-based creatures. Our very survival hinges on our ability to live amongst other people. To be stripped of that connection is painful, it's swift, it's thought to be reformative. Once America transitioned out of their white makeup brand era, that is to say when they started pretending like they cared about the equality of everyone, public punishment fell out of favor. There wasn't supposed to be social hierarchy in this new America. And don't bring up slavery or indigenous genocide or anti-Semitism or Jim Crow laws or anti-Asian racism or violent misogyny or misogynoir or religious discrimination or the wage gap or poverty or war or colonization or the villainization of immigrants. The founding father cucks don't like when you talk about that and it's best that we appear them or else username bunch of numbers will get mad at me. The best implementation for restorative justice during this era was not to disrupt social reputation, but to take away the prevailing notion evident in all men. All men. <laughs> and that was freedom. So what did we start doing? We started putting people in jail, baby. You get incarcerated, you get incarcerated, you get incarcerated. And the ironic thing is this punishment still depends on the disruption, not only of a person's freedom, but also their social reputation and ability to coexist amongst communities. Despite falling out of favor in the 1800s, public shaming hasn't been entirely stamped out. Paul Zeal refers to it as scarlet letter shaming based on the 1850 novel, The Scarlet Letter. That's just a story about a woman having a baby out of wedlock in a time where people had nothing better to do than eat boiled beef and not know math. So they publicly shamed her for it. There, I'd save you the trip to Sparknotes. Especially online, public shaming and netizen vigilantism are running rampant. It's believed that humiliation, doxing, and dogpiling has the potential to positively reform targets because it deters them and potential others from repeatedly indulging in their transgressions. This brings us to the reality of question one. The shame and public punishment produce authentic accountability. Emphasis on authentic. Will the mean girls featured in that creator's TikTok take accountability for their actions and refrain from being mean to others after their public dragging? Will Hailey Bieber think twice about allegedly bullying women in relation to her husband? I think the potential of that sort of reform in the face of online vigilantism is very, very low. And here's why. I want you to look at every single person who began as public enemies in their online dragging. Are they still enemies by the end of it? At least in their minds? Or have they managed to successfully skirt around the boundaries of growth by visualizing themselves, perhaps rightfully so to a degree, as victims themselves? While there are people who can experience threats of violence, doxing, or general dogpiling and still find it more pertinent to hold themselves accountable rather than focusing all of their energy on their maltreatment, I also think this is a very small percentage of people. Most people's first instinct when getting attacked in this manner is to get defensive, even if they have done something wrong. They're able to believe that while their transgressions were wrong, the punishment they received at the hands of millions of people on the internet far outweighed their own faults. Therefore, they feel justified in removing the blame from themselves and placing the blame on people they view as opposition. The ops, if you will, if you wanna get academic about it. I think shame has the ability to make us self-reflect, certainly, but more often than not, it makes us highly defensive. 
it makes it nearly impossible to look beyond the faults that we committed, either because we cave in on ourselves in self-repulsion and we self-pity, or because we shift blame onto others to spare ourselves the humility. I think if conducted well, if performed in a calculated manner, you can argue that shame is effective in reform, but I don't think the internet has what it takes to do it properly. Firstly, shame on such a large scale does nothing for anyone involved. Historic acts of public humiliation were reserved for small and moderate communities who, quite frankly, never experienced electricity, let alone TikTok. Meanwhile, the internet is home to millions upon millions of people who, at any given moment, can dedicate their entire day to your public lashing. Y'all think a sour gummy worm would kill a Victorian child? Try introducing it to the internet on the day Cakegate started. This is the baddest cake in the motherfucking store. How you doing? Now, mind you, this isn't a critique of cancel culture. Every time I try to voice my thoughts on the subject, I think of every Republican tirade about the woke liberal left and what they want to do to the traditional living room. Talking about cancel culture, girl, cancel my student loans. How about that? Cancel culture is not the problem. Much like wokeness, it thrived in black communities as a way to describe community-based action against oppression. To cancel something meant more to divest from it rather than to abuse it, because taking away from systems that harm is more effective than giving to them, even if that gift is death threats. Just like every other thing pertinent to the black community, cancel culture was plucked out of its original surroundings and fostered to create something much more apathetic. It became synonymous with mobs and online harassment rather than community care and divestment. Cancel culture is not in itself toxic. It's the people who co-opt it for their own selfish reasons that are toxic. I'm not calling for a lack of accountability or an end to call-in culture, but simply a desire to see true accountability be achieved through more effective means. Community-based criticism and discussion must come first, and it must be a balanced blend of rejection, redirection, and constructive criticism. And it must also take into account the severity of the crime. None of the main girls featured in today's video have committed acts of violence or racism that we know of, sans Hailey Bieber allegedly, according to past tweets. Allegedly. We don't know if they're proven bigots, murderers, stalkers, or even irredeemably bad people down to their core. Therefore, the main purpose of this video is not to discuss acts of revenge against violence or bigotry, but rather vengeance against lesser crimes like being mean or rude. And when I say lesser, I clearly don't mean entirely without harm. Being mean or rude to someone, especially repeatedly, has great consequences and should be taken seriously. Carl, if you're watching this, I am so sorry, but I will butcher your name if I say it. I'll put it on the screen, but there is this person named Carl who um, explores the act of internet vigilantism in their 2010 thesis. In it, they state, when a crime is intentionally committed, moral outrage may be evoked and the punishment motive may take the form of just desserts, which elicits a desire for punishment proportional to the severity of the crime committed. The issue is most dogpiling that occurs on the internet is not done in response to proportionate crimes. I found that while there is usually backlash against things like racism or anti-Semitism, it's usually short-lived. It holds nothing to the five month long dragging of Hailey Bieber or other mean girls still getting their lashings on TikTok. For an app with the attention span of a fish, people sure know how to suddenly pay attention. This brings us to question two. Does our online treatment of people who commit non-bigoted, non-violent social transgressions reflect the internet's fetish for violent punishment? You know how there's this running joke that Batman will beat you within an inch of your life if you steal an apple from the grocery store or commit a rolling stop at a stop sign? Despite everyone generally liking Batman, especially when he looks as pathetic and desirable as Robert Pattinson's portrayal, <laughs> we also come to a justified conclusion that he's kind of a cop. <laughs> he gives carceral energy. His arsenal of retribution is not diverse. It often focuses on direct and dehumanizing punishment, no matter the crime. Hey 
man. I think you got him. You want what he's having? I think the internet is the same way. It's controversial to state on the internet that doxing, death threats, and plural months long humiliation is not a proportionate punishment for being mean. People believe that by stating so, you wish to participate in this lawless country devoid of accountability. But I, on the other hand, think it's the complete opposite. Our desire to dox, threaten, and repeatedly lash individuals who did not otherwise commit acts of violence or bigotry stems not from our need of restorative justice, but instead from our selfish need to indulge in the very transgression that we are criticizing. And that is being an asshole. <laughs> when a negative situation happened between me and a creator about a year or so ago, I firstly communicated with that creator about the situation and how I felt about it. But about a week later, I came onto my channel and I made a video using the situation as a sort of example in a larger conversation. The example wasn't meant to be taken so to heart. It was really just an anecdote in a conversation that I felt was pertinent at the time. But when I posted that video, I tried to protect that creator's identity because quite frankly, it wasn't anyone else's business. I talked to that creator personally and was using the situation as an example in a much larger conversation. Even so, people still took it upon themselves to figure out who that creator was, getting it wrong multiple times, mind you, and proceeded to leave nasty comments on their page. They did it under the guise of protecting me, despite me constantly stating, both in the video and in the comments, that I don't fuck with that behavior whatsoever. <laughs> when I made yet another statement telling people to stop, practically begging at that point, someone replied to me and said that, I can't tell them what to do. Girl, don't piss me off. The goal of online harassment is not always to restore justice. It's not always this moral revenge. A lot of the time, it's done simply because people want a reason to be mean and they finally have this excuse that feels justified. It allows them to play out their own mean girl fantasies without the same repercussions of doing it in person. They wouldn't even find it normal. If you were casually walking down the street and happened upon a crowd of millions cornering one single target, you would think that's fucking draconian. But on the internet, it seems almost natural to partake in this behavior. In terms of the second story we covered of the girls being mean to an influencer at a baseball game, I saw one commenter state that bullying is reprehensible because it can lead to self-inflicted death. Sorry, I'm censoring, you know how the internet is which is very true. But when someone else pointed out that the girls facing the wrath of millions of people on the internet could also be negatively harmed, even to the point of harming themselves, that first commenter came back and said, I don't care if those pieces of shits kill themselves. They shouldn't have been mean in the first place. You did it. You ironically missed the point of your own morals. You said something edgy and weird. Now try saying something sobering and beautiful. During the chaos that ensued from the bullying TikTok at the Astros game, a lot of people were calling for the identities of unrelated people in the background of the video to be revealed as well. They wanted to get their side of the story or see what they knew about the mean girls. At one point, someone who kind of looked like one of the mean girls was misidentified as them and was flooded with hate. Click the search bar. My video was the first one to pop up and everybody was quick to think it was me and my cousin and my sister, the ones that were bullying her. We started getting hate comments, um, talking about my crunchy hair and how like I needed to go to the gym and how my upper body was bigger than my lower body. <laughs> Dude, my hands were like sweating because I was like, what the heck is going on? I I don't even go out. Like I, I was like, what the heck is going on? I think online vigilantism sometimes disguises itself as an attempt to hold people accountable but it really just serves selfish reasons. The internet's imprecision makes it both easier and harder to criticize. 
And what I mean by that is it's easy to be critical in the sense of being disparaging on the internet because you're able to be relatively anonymous on the internet, but it's also harder to constructively criticize because those that posit rational educational takes who are seeking to call in people are often drowned out by the people who just want some bloody entertainment. Dogpiling is so popular because it speaks to many people's need to feel powerful in an otherwise powerless state especially in the case of the TikTok dog piles that censor the takedown of bullies and mean girls. The goal isn't to change these girls' behavior or even to support the person who was harmed by these girls' behavior. It's to conduct our own revenge fantasies against the bullies in our own lives, past or present. Maybe we feel powerless in handling those who mistreat us in person, so we act out our desires online. We make another person's pain, the person who was bullied in the first place, our own personal demonstration. And I know this to be true because even after victims of bullying have come forward to denounce the hate trains against their bullies, people won't stop. Jackie La Bonita came back to TikTok nervous as hell begging people to stop harassing the girls in that video, stating that she did not intend nor expect such a level of vigilantism to occur. Selena Gomez has constantly told the internet and the media for years by this point to stop pitting her against other women and to stop harassing people in her name. No one does what they say because no one is working in their honor. The goal here is self-indulgence not social reform. It makes me wonder how different and how much more effective these situations could become if people prioritized care over conflict. And I'm not as naive to think that everything on planet Earth can be solved if we just fight fire with butterflies. By any means necessary, am I right? But I am hardened enough by the neglect my own pain in life has received to understand the power of being heard, listened to, and generally cared for. I found that people who commit themselves to hating my enemies often tend to lose the plot or lose steam when it comes to genuinely supporting me. All of their energy is spent on revenge and wrath and hatred, and they have none left over for asking me how I feel or treating me with patience or pride. Our final question for today asks, does our thirst for punishment outweigh our capacity for support? And I think after a certain point, it very much does. I want to imagine what would happen if, instead of committing themselves to doxing and harassing Jackie La Bonita's bullies, the community focused on sending her kind messages and support. I wonder if she would have been allowed more space and opportunity to talk about the negative effects of bullying that happened to other people and also herself too. But instead, she was forced to come on here and defend her bullies and take heed of their concerns over her own. Instead of coming back to the internet with support and kindness, the majority of people's affection was overshadowed by the drama that ensued. You could argue that it's possible to do both at once, to support someone while harassing their enemies, but like I said before, one option exhausts the self so much that you don't have much room for the other. And besides, if they have to choose between the two, a lot of the people on the internet have shown that they'd rather indulge in vengeance and wrath and internet vigilantism than to support those that they are avenging. The whole thing kind of just reminds me of that Megan Thee Stallion quote that's like, are they supporting you or really just attacking me? The answer is usually the latter. People would rather die tomorrow if it means they can be haters today than to live a full life by caring for other people. You may be asking yourself, what would you do then if mass harassment is off the table? I think about what I would want people to have done if I was in high school again getting bullied. So many people knew what was happening to me and so many of them failed to properly support me. And the thing that really made a difference was finding my best friend of 10 years now who gave me a reason to come to school every morning despite the torment that I knew I was bound to face. This past decade, every time I would vent to her about a problem and vice versa, her first response has always been to check on my well-being and 
asked me how I would best be comforted. And then if I wanted to vent or if it was appropriate, she would commence verbal revenge against whatever problem I was having. She never once has made me question whether her support could be tired out by violent revenge because she never resorts to violent revenge first. She saves her energy for loving me and lets the rest happen if it needs to. This sort of love gives space for healing and allows people to share their experiences more freely. I wish Jackie La Bonita and Selena Gomez and everyone else who has been bullied, whether they are highly visible or not, had more space to discuss these tough topics without having to clip their tongues the way the internet makes you. People should be able to share their experiences with the expectations of support rather than the fear of causing drama and prolonged harassment against the people they're talking about. Just because I share it doesn't mean it's not still mine. And if you want to indulge in your inner gossip or if you want to react for months on end about this crazy story you heard on the internet, do what the rest of us normal people do and talk someone's ear off about it in real life. Annoy your close friends and family. Create enemies by how much you can't stop talking about that thing that has no impact on your life whatsoever. I think we could learn a lot from my best friend and I think we could learn even greater the importance of community and how the internet, while having the ability to foster connections, also has the potential to degrade it if left unchecked. By way of closing, I also want to note that if you are being bullied or you know someone who is, I will be leaving some resources down in the description box for you. I can assure you that living and cultivating a life that you desire for yourself is the greatest revenge you could ever enact against someone else. As Pierce the Veil said, there is Damn. There's no greater vengeance than learning to enjoy again. Hope you get the message. <laughs> you deserve to be here just as much as everyone else. And the world, your world especially, would be very dim without you in it. Thank you so much for watching. I love you guys so much. And I will see you some other time in some other part of the internet being insufferable. <laughs> Stay safe.